So we were talking about before we were recording about um, ATP synthase, you know, inside your mitochondria, you've got this little, it's like a little flywheel type thing, right? And like, so the electrons flow through it essentially and create energy. And, you know, we have something like a lightning bolt's worth of energy circulating inside of our body. And I think what we need to look at is not like, well, how do I increase energetic flow across meridians and some of the Eastern medicine stuff, which again has like, I'm woo woo enough to actually accept a lot of the Eastern stuff. I think there's a crossover there for sure. Like I'm, I'm the first to admit that I'm a little woo woo on things. But what's interesting is when you look at also a Western principle and you say, okay, we know how this mitochondria works, how we produce energy. You stop thinking about calories so much and you don't necessarily say calories don't matter because clearly the evidence shows they matter but we start thinking of energy and how we create more energy, right? And there are gonna be times in our lives when a low carb state might allow you to produce more energy. I'm not talking about the energy that says like calories. I'm talking about the energy that says I am getting more force output. I am getting more pep in my step. I'm getting more explosivity with my step. My hip flexors aren't just schlepping my legs around. My entire leg is firing and I'm moving when I walk. And a lot of times, high carbohydrate does that for people. Right, and so this is coming from a low carb guy. I will absolutely admit that, like periodic, like carbohydrate influx, can change how your body manufactures energy. And there's an adaptation that occurs. And I encourage people to always look at whether it's carbs, whether it's good quality fats. A lot of these things, like a lot of times, more is better than less. If we can keep our finger on the pulse of our activity. So right, the caveat with this is that people, I think, are disconnected from that, sometimes to no fault of their own. Like there's just a little or disconnect, or there is a hindrance to their ability to do so, where they are absolutely stuck in a job, or they just have a hard time moving. Even then, there's ways around it. But let's just say, hypothetically, like they're, they're stuck in a box, they can't really get out of their cubicle. If they were to just increase their rate of calories and, and food, it wouldn't necessarily increase their flux, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But if someone has free will to move around and they have clear communication and lower levels of inflammation to a degree that they can get these signals from the food and the electrons that are doing the work in the mitochondria to create energy, they're gonna feel that energy and they're naturally gonna to wanna to move more and it's not even gonna be conscious, it's just gonna be happening. That's 100% what I'm talking about right there is, is the, the motivation, you know, the, the like not just like, like, oh, I'm gonna go like work out today. But the motivation to not only work out, but when you're working out, you're working out harder than normal. You don't even realize it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you don't even, you, and, and you just maybe just have a little bit more, like you said, pep in your step. You have a little extra energy while you're training. This diet, you know, when I've done other diets before, I've never had an issue with like brain fog. I've never had an issue with energy. Like I always feel like I have good energy. I always feel uh, good when I'm training. But much like we've, you know, much like it's been stated before by many other people saying like a lot of people don't understand how bad they feel. I guess I didn't understand how much I was missing out because carbohydrates, they do so much more than just kind of give you like sugar and energy. They're, they're, they're really hydrating, <laughs> they're really hydrating your muscle tissues. Like it's almost like they turn on like the electricity of the body in maybe some sort of different way. I don't even know if that's like a true thing or if I mean No, that's that. been demonstrated. I mean, that's, that, is a, that is a real thing from a hydration perspective. Obviously, there's the glycogen piece. You hold 3.4 grams of water for 3.7 grams of water for every one gram. Yes, but there is a like conduit of sort I think of carbohydrates deliver oxygen to the muscle cells and stuff like that too. So there's all kinds of things that happen, which I don't even know if I'm accurate in saying that, but it's something along those lines. Well, I think the beauty of what you and I have both done, and I think, you know, I don't want people to get the wrong idea on what I'm doing. I experiment with everything, right? I would still consider myself, I, I find my sweet spot being relatively low carb with periodic surges of high carb. It's been that way for quite a while, and people that watch my channel know that, um, that I, I always experiment, I always kind of flip things on its head. Just why not? <laughs> you know, uh, that's isn't that the point of being metabolically flexible. I mean, all the videos I've made for the last decade talking about achieving metabolic flexibility. Somewhere along the lines, it got confusing where metabolic flexibility meant low carb because you're making yourself metabolic flexible. No, like low carb can certainly undo a lot of things. There's a lot of benefits to that. And 
perhaps overlapping benefits, but the point is that I've achieved metabolic flexibility. Now it's my duty, and also fun, to push the different levers and push the, and, and experience different things. And what I've definitely learned out of all of this is that, A, there's a lot of different ways to skin this cat. Uh, B, low carb absolutely positively works, and so does high carb. And uh, it's, it'll be interesting, you know, when you continue on this for a while to see what happens a few months from now when you decide, hey, you know what, okay, now for a few weeks, I'm gonna go really low carb, high fat, just watch what the heck happens, right? Like, I don't think you're gonna have this catastrophic, like, lipid disaster. I think you're gonna have a couple days of wonkiness, and then your body's gonna thrive on something that was a serious change again. But you might also recognize now that you have contrast, like, oh, wait, my collagen levels are a little lower, you know, maybe I don't have as much pep in my step, but maybe I feel a little bit better in other ways, or better, like, on endurance. You're not running right now, so it's hard to say, I guess I should back up for a second. I mean, one of the big things that I have noticed is if my carbohydrates are higher, then when I am running, I need to fuel into a run, which I never had to do before. If carbohydrates aren't in my diet, I can run legit 25 miles, totally fasted, no problem. If carbohydrates are on board, I have a little more pep, a little more power, a little more explosivity, a little more muscle stability, and actually body feels better when I'm running. However, after about five, six miles, I gotta fuel. Otherwise, I fall. So it'll be interesting to see, like, because you haven't been running during the sugar diet, where, like, how wonder how it would impact longer distance performance. I'm super excited to test this diet out with running, especially like in particular with sprinting, because you know when I do get back into running, like there'll be some long distance stuff here and there, uh, but my long distance stuff uh, probably for a while will probably only be like three to five miles, so that's not very far. But yeah, I'm I'm excited to you know give it a shot with uh, with the sprinting and stuff I'm doing. I think um, I think I'll be able to make progress faster. You know, one thing you mentioned um, you mentioned two things. You know, one is like you know what does this look like a couple months down the road, uh, and the other thing you mentioned was there's more than one way to skin a cat, and I kind of wonder like how many different ways are there to really get like shredded. Um, Typically in bodybuilding, it's almost always done with higher carbohydrate and pretty low fat. Like almost always. I, I do understand there's exceptions, right? So the other way I guess to skin this cat, there are some people who have utilized keto. Um, I know there's uh, Robert Sykes, keto brick guy. Um, and then he also coaches some people and stuff like that. So we can't dismiss, even if it's like, not a huge subset of people that are like utilizing these diets to these extremes and I don't I don't think that we have to always look to like bodybuilding as like some sort of representation that like a diet works really well um, nor do I think that we have to look to professional athletes but I do kind of like the top-down theory and idea like a lot of the safety features in your car come from uh, from car racing you know and, and so I think a lot of times when, when you're like, okay, it helps these people who are way the hell up here, then it probably will help a lot of other people as well. And it, it's just like interesting how intuitive a lot of great athletes are with being drawn to sugar. Or even kids, you know, and kids are quick and kids are like, they're fidgety. And I think they recognize that they must need that to help them like express themselves more and to move around more and to like, and like, because. We know as a human how important movement is for us. And then so therefore we're attached to this energy, which is like food. But I think for some reason, and some reason the sugars are sweet. Like that's super interesting too. Yeah. Why do they hit us so hard? It's an interesting though? thing. Like it's almost like it, yeah, there's a, this principle of like the body is telling you to eat it. Boom, like it just blows yeah. your head right off your shoulders, you know, if you eat something, uh, if you eat something sweet, it's just kind of like, yeah, really uh, changes your mood. Like it's like hedonic, you know. Do you it's just get concerned with the like the dopamine hit from it, though. Do you find that that's transferring into other things? I'm not. I not, there's nothing I can like put my finger on right now for not myself. Like, like Doom scrolling more. It's like you know, there's these loops, right? Like there's these. I'm always aware of that, right? Because I notice things like 
if my phone habits, if I, if I find that I'm like on my phone more, usually also translates into like other behaviors that I'm looking, don't, looking for. I would, I would say for sure that sugar can make you very fidgety and it can probably, for some people that may already have anxiety, it might make them more anxious. So they might be, they might need to be like way more cautious with how much carbohydrate. For myself, I feel like I can blast, you know, two or three hundred grams of carbs that primarily come from like juice or fruit. You're calm anyway, though. You're and not calm person. Yeah, and I, I don't seem to have that big of an issue with it, but I have had issues with it uh, a couple of times now. And then uh, one time before bed, I don't even know what the hell I ate, but I, I think I had like a smoothie and it was like maybe an hour before bed and I was just like staring at the ceiling and I was like kind of fidgety that day and I, I got up and I like got on my phone because I just couldn't go to sleep. But that's why the worst thing to do is to get, to get on your phone. <laughs> so yeah, I did have uh, that happen uh, one time and so there are probably some pitfalls that you need to probably look out for when you're uh, when you're doing, uh, when you're, when you're you know, blasting these carbohydrates. But kind of just back to the athlete thing, like just think from a professional athlete standpoint, like there's really, I'm not saying professional athletes eat perfectly either but there's really not hardly any professional athletes in the bigger sports that are subscribing to a really low carb diet. So I mentioned that to say that if you're somebody that wants to perform well and you want to train well in the gym, I'm, again, I'm not saying that you have to eat this particular way, but it's very interesting that most people choose to eat a different way. They're choosing to eat more carbohydrate. And so for those of us that want to get after the gym and for those of us that maybe want to get bigger or stronger or faster, maybe you have this in consideration and maybe you don't have to do it all the time either because maybe you like the benefits of high fat for, other, for various reasons. Maybe you like the benefits of low carb for other reasons. I know for myself, the low carb foods, I love them. Like I love eggs, I love bacon, I like uh, meat with just like a little bit more fat in it. I love salmon, I love mackerel, I love, uh, what are those things I could cut the cod livers I brought you last time? Yeah, I love, I love all that kind of stuff. I love butter. And so for me, like there's no question, you know, a couple months from now that I will revert back to doing other dietary protocols or at least intermittently uh, sprinkle in some other uh, diets I don't really think I'll do like car carnivore was something like I just experimented with and I, I did it every time Sean Baker brought around uh, World Carnivore Month and then on my YouTube channel I did 100 days of carnivore to try to see like what I felt about that but after doing carnivore for 100 days I didn't notice any extra benefits from it I just um, I really just end up like just eating more because I was trying to like satiate myself with the with the food that I had, you know, the, my choices of food, which was just meat. <laughs> and so that just didn't work out from like a, I was hoping that it would have like some uh, body composition impact, but it just, it really didn't for me. Um, and then over time I started moving in into more of like having, you know, meat and vegetables and meat and fruit and stuff like that.